over to you, Matt. Great, thanks, Matt. And um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have everyone on this uh, this beautiful sunny day. Um, this is the Robert Half Candidate Webinar Series. We have nine. Um, this is the second one. Um, and today we're going to be talking about recognizing the opportunity. It's great to see that we've got so many people returning back from last week. Um, our first week was clarifying your goals, which was a tremendous success. And we've had some great feedback. So really delighted and excited to be presenting this. Um, you know, looking for a new job will certainly mean one thing. You'll need to deal with change. In this episode, we will offer advice on recognizing the change curve, including honing the skills you have learning new ones and how to frame them to reach the widest spectrum of opportunity, even if that means considering something entirely new and having an open mind. Um, my name's Matt Weston. I'm hosting uh, the forum today. Um, I'm the UK Managing Director of Robert Half. I've been with the business for over 21 years, so I have a good insight to all our lines of business across our 22 branch network. Um, again, we have a tremendous panel. Um, we have our three external um, panelists returning again, um, and we have a new addition to the, to the panel, which is uh, Gareth Gage of Robert Half. So without further ado, I think it would be great to, to have an introduction to those individuals again. So if I can go to you, Cheryl, to, uh, to kick us off. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the invite, and wow, what an introduction. Um, so hi, hi, everyone. My name's Cheryl Miller. I qualified um, as a chartered accountant many, many years ago with EY. Um, I've held a number of finance, commercial and strategic roles during my career. Um, for the last seven years or so, I've been working as an interim, leading large scale finance transformation programmes and have recently moved out of the corporate space actually to focus more on coaching and mentoring individuals who want to set up businesses and follow their passions. Brilliant. Thanks, Cheryl. And uh, over to Emma. Hi guys, so for those of you who saw me last week, I'm back. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Emma Howard. So I've got 15 years worth of working weirdly, often with really senior finance teams, um, but from a HR perspective. So I've recruited at every level from group CFOs all the way down to graduate teams um, and really working with people to try and understand how you make your career something that you really enjoy doing rather than something that you have to uh, you know, drag yourself into every day. So thank you for having us back, Matt. Great, thanks Emma. Janet. Hi there, thanks a lot Matt. Uh, my name is Janet Moran. Uh, my background is in uh, corporate human resources and I've worked in manufacturing and financial services. But for the last 14 years, uh, I've been helping people to get jobs. So my business helps people with things like CV and LinkedIn preparation. Um, there's a little bit of coaching thrown in and I do some corporate outplacement. Great, thanks Janet. And Gareth? Yep, so, uh, so hi everybody, my name's Gareth Gage. Um, I'm one of the UK directors for, for Robert Half, so I'm uh, lucky enough to be part of uh, Matt Weston's leadership team. Um, I've been with the business for, for 10 years and uh, in the industry for 17 years. Um, and I look after um, what we call the regions of Robert Half, which is, um, which is everything outside of London and, uh, and Greater London. Um, I grew up as a, uh, as a finance um, specialist within the recruitment industry, um, but now we'll look after um, all, all divisions within the business. Great. Thanks, Gareth. And as you can see, we've got a very uh, experienced panel who are very well positioned to answer the questions that are going to be posed today. So just a bit of etiquette on the call. So we're going to start with... Um, uh, a poll and we're going to have three polls uh, between you know in the, in the course of the hour um, we're going to answer five to six key questions um, but then we're also going to have Q&A at the end I think one of the learnings that we had from last week is uh, we didn't probably have enough opportunity to have Q&A um, now through the course of this we have the chat function if you can put the questions as you think of them through um, the course of the forum. That would be great and we'll answer those at the end. I will say you'll see the details and the contact details of myself and the panelists. So please, if there's any questions that you don't get to or you think about, um, please send them through to us. We've had a number of people reach out over the last course of this week who, who uh, attended last week. So we wanna make sure that this is, is it interactive as possible and we wanna make sure that we cover everything uh, every eventuality question um, that, that comes up either today or, or post the event. So, so without further ado, um, I think it'd be great if we can kick this, um, kick this off with a poll. Um, and the poll is going to be, how do you feel about your current employment prospects at the moment? You're going to see 
the categories of competent, worried, stroke concerned, ambivalent, or cautious. So if everyone can vote, um, and Matt, you can report back to us very, very shortly on the results. Yes, yeah, certainly. We'll just give everyone a couple of uh, more seconds just to um, enter their answers in there. So it looks like the majority have voted. So I'm just going to end the poll now. Okay, and I'm just going to share the results with you all. Okay, so um, for those of you on screen as well, you should be able to see those results. Okay, great. Well, look, you know, I think it's just good for maybe for us and the panelists to get maybe a feel for how everyone's feeling at the moment, a little bit of a pulse check. I think obviously clearly you can see there 63% um, of people who have voted is, um, is worried and concerned. And I think one of the things that we're hoping through this series is to give confidence and probably help people adapt for the changing environment. There is certainly um, optimism in the marketplace. If we look at our stats, things are moving in the right direction. So hopefully we can instill a few people with, with confidence through the, the course of the series. So um, with that, um, we're going to now move on to question one, um, which is if people are feeling stuck and stagnant in their role, what are some of the steps that you would suggest someone to take to help them decide on a possible route for their next move? And I think we'll probably firstly reach out to, I think Cheryl, you're, you're in a good position to help with this question. Sure, um, it's, it's an interesting one that really. I mean, feeling stuck, you know, and obviously it was interesting to see the results of the poll, um, recognizing that, you know, almost two thirds are feeling worried or concerned. You know, these, these are, um, you know, they're real and valid feelings that we have. Feeling stuck is really, um, it's, a, it's a state of mind. And the best way that we can change that state of mind so that we are really well positioned for the opportunities is to really change the mindset so that we can make the decisions and take the actions that we need to become unstuck. Um, or another way of actually saying unstuck is to become free, which is a lot more compelling and appealing than being um, unstuck. Um, so I want to suggest three ways that people can really um, sort of free their minds and start to th think a lot more creatively about what might be out there um, and how their potential can be best used um, in, a, in a field of all possibilities, if I put it in that way. So the three things I want to suggest is the first one is um, find somebody that you trust to help you explore what your options are. It can always help to get a different perspective on things. So I know certainly myself in the past, I've gone to old bosses or colleagues, or actually um, I've even reached out to um, recruitment consultants who I've had a really good working relationship with. So the guys here at Robert Half, you know, are very used to kind of working with people at different stages of their career. So if you're kind of struggling to think, you know, where next, what might my skills be applicable to, to reach out to the guys here and see whether you can get some advice that might just help to start to open the mind in terms of what's possible. Um, the second one that I've got is actually just, um, and I'm thinking about something that we talked about at the last webinar, which was reimagining, you know, reimagining the future. So in my work in transformation, um, I've seen a lot of changes coming for a while now in terms of how organisations work um, and, and what that means in terms of roles. Um, there's a couple of really good um, articles that I just point you to. Um, um, there's one by EY called Framing the Future. And there's another one by Deloitte called Deloitte Human Capital Trends. They're both really, really recent. And actually, if you have a look at them, it starts to kind of open the mind in terms of what's possible, where organisations are going. And it's not only applicable for you in your roles, but actually it's also applicable in terms of understanding the challenges that organisations are facing so that, that we as, you know, kind of finance, HR, tech or marketing professionals can be stronger business partners in that space as well. So that's my second one. It's to kind of reimagine the future and what your role could look like in that future. And then my third one, um, just to get a little bit um, kind of less cerebral, um, I'm going to talk about changing your routine so that you change your thought patterns, because often we kind of get stuck in a rut, um, particularly as, as finance professionals, you know, we, we like routine and sometimes that doesn't help the mind become unstuck and get out of those negative thought patterns. So if, you know, during the last three months you've been cycling, running, walking, etc., every day, my suggestion is just to change the route, literally just change the direction that you're going in. That will actually start to get the creative juices flowing and you'll potentially start to come up with some different options. Um, so just do something to get the brain into a far more creative space. That's it really, my, my top three tips for getting unstuck. 
Oh, great. Thank you. Any Anything anyone else would add? Yes, um, I've, I've got a couple of things. Thanks, uh, Cheryl. Um, I'm a big fan of structure and having a structured approach to a job search. So I think if you are feeling stuck and stagnant, um, consider why. What, what is it that's perhaps, perhaps lost its shine? What was never maybe right about the role in the first place? Um, and then secondly, you know, what, what's your vision? What, what makes you happy? What makes you miserable in a role? What works for you and what doesn't? And identifying your skills is obviously key. Cheryl mentioned that. And recruiters don't just need to know that you think you have those skills. They need evidence of that. So think about what you've actually done, not just in your, your current role and your previous roles, but perhaps outside of your day job, perhaps in some other capacity that's voluntary, um, or might even be, I hate to say it, you know, part of your, your hobby suite. Um, but what do you have to offer? Or what is it that you enjoy doing? So start to think about some of those things and then launch on a bit of research just so that you understand what might be possible. Brilliant, thanks Cheryl. That's great, so um, thank you Janet. Um, okay, so Matt, now I think we're, um, we're moved to a, a second poll. Uh, so this is what we're going to poll here is for your next opportunity. What are you thinking? Is that retraining, setting up on your own, doing the same type of role, looking for a promotion, moving company, or I just need a, a job? So we'll give that 30 seconds for everyone to vote. Just yeah. give it another yeah. few seconds, yeah. There's still some people um, answering at the moment, Matt, so we'll just give it another couple of seconds. Okay, so I'm about to end the poll. There we go. I was going to share the results with you all. Here we go. I'm just going to bring that onto the screen. Okay. There you go. Quite, quite interesting. So it's good to see that a few people who are, who are looking to do something different and go into different areas, obviously a few entrepreneurs there who are looking to set up, but you know, maybe, you know, we see most of the numbers are doing the same type of role or moving company, which uh, is probably to be expected. So um, that's, that's very interesting to see. So, um, okay, so we move on to question two. Um, you know, for those who have, who have no choice in having to look for a role, what advice would you give about not holding on to resentment overcoming stress and negativity as they embark on the new search for work. I think we all know that maybe some forced um, role changes are there. I think obviously you've got to go into the, the next role with the right mindset. So I think that's a really interesting question. So um, I think probably Emma, you're very yeah. well placed to answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about holding on to, on to resentment and negativity. But first of all, let me just say to all of you who do have no choice but to look for a new role, I'm really sorry because I know how stressful that can feel. At the same time, I'm really excited for you because I truly believe that, that kind of better things are coming and that the opportunities that are going to be ahead of you are going to be greater than the ones you've left behind. Um, so a little bit like the other panellists, when I was thinking about this question, I came up with kind of five things that I was suggesting that you should do. Um, and the first one is make a list of all the things that you're really annoyed with your old workplace about. If it's just for you, please don't send it to them, but get it all out. Because one of the ways you don't overcome resentment or stress or negativity is by pretending it's not there. So just get it all out, write it all down, and then start a new list of what it is that you're actually looking for. And that leads on to my second point, which is a really important one, which is around getting clear around what you're looking for, but being flexible around what that looks like. So in my work, when I'm working with people who are looking for work or, you know, changing jobs, often the more panicked and the more stressed we get, the more rigid we get around what we're looking at. So I've had people before, you know, who are looking for work, who've turned down jobs because they haven't been perfect. And that's an indication you're really in distress. They get really clear, but remain quite flexible. Um, the next thing I'd say is start to work with the right people. So a little bit like Cheryl mentioned before, you know, Robert Half obviously have a great suite of consultants who really can help you um, understand what's out there in the marketplace. Equally, there are experts like Cheryl, like myself, like Janet, who really can help you kind of overcome that. And it's worth putting your time into thinking, who are the people who I want to link in with? And kind of utilize it. There's lots of services out there. Um, there's then something that I think is massively important, which is around keeping your spirits up. 
So I don't go in for false positivity. Um, and actually on our podcast, Cheryl and I talked around kind of your know, toxic positivity at certain points. So let yourself feel it and then keep your spirits up. So just because you're looking for work, it doesn't mean you need to be chained to your kitchen table nine hours a day applying over and over. A little bit like Janet had said, get yourself a structure, but build in some time for you to actually do things that you really enjoy. Um, and then my last point around, you know, overcoming stress, letting go of that resentment, not getting drawn into negativity, social media and the news, limit it. So I'm going to be really blunt with you. Social media is everybody's, you know, fantastic lifestyles and it's going to make you feel worse the more you see it. I even think that's true of LinkedIn at the moment. So limit your time that you're spending on all of those external things. Um, and don't be fooled because everybody's finding this difficult. You're not the only person out there who's looking for a role. You're not on your own. Um, and remember, although this feels really difficult, it will change. And I truly believe that for most of you, this is going to be the start of something um, new and hopefully much better than that that you've left. Mm. Really, really good points. Is it any, any of the panelists who have anything to add? Anything from you, Gareth? Yeah, um, Matt, I, I, would, I would just say, um, you know, uh, following on from, from what Emma said is, uh, you know, I think it's really, really important to um, to surround yourself with positive people. And if there if there are individuals that um, you know are in your network or, or they're in your friendship group um, that you always have a giggle with or you always feel good after talking to them, then just make sure that you you know you're keeping in contact with those individuals. So I think I think sometimes it it will be very easy to go away from those those individuals because you're, you're probably feeling a bit down. But actually, do the opposite and and yeah. and towards those individuals, and I think you know they'll they'll bring you up and uh, you know uh, and and hopefully help you out. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, right. So um, moving on to uh, to question three. Um, so job hunting requires pers uh, perseverance, resilience, determination, and will include many many setbacks. What are the key coping mechanisms? To keep you focused and I'll, I'll reach out to Janet for this one thanks Matt um, I'm afraid I'm going to come back to structure again have a plan if you have a plan it gives you some feeling of control over what is happening to you perhaps in circumstances where you have felt completely out of control and that you haven't taken decisions about your own future um, so know, know what it is that you're aiming for know what your tactics are going to be and give yourself some time out um, be active so do network reach out to all sorts of people not just on linkedin but on but friends and family sometimes it's really mm. strange where leads can come from mm. so keep a dialogue going each job search is different and certainly the circumstances that we're in at the moment are unique i think we would all agree so don't be too hard on yourself and learn to take nothing personally this is not about your innate qualities as a human being it is mm -hmm. a process that you need to go through and some of it is a little bit scientific in that you need to match your competencies skill set and experience to those that are being sought in an environment that you want to move into so it isn't about how good you are it's it's just not that straightforward definitely build a support system and take care of yourself don't you know as as was mentioned earlier don't just spend all your time sitting staring at your laptop firing off applications because a scattergun approach just doesn't work and you'd be far better probably going for a nice walk or um, as we've been advised soon to be heading off to the pub yeah <laughs> And um, I think I think one point, you know, you talk about uh, it came up last week and maybe I'll defer to Gareth for this one. But I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people who go through the process of applying for permanent roles. We talked about um, having an open mind and managing some of the setbacks by having an open mind to interim assignments. So maybe that that's something that you can fill us in on, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, that sometimes you can, uh, you, you know, two things happen is 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 people um, either either sit and uh, and wait for that perfect opportunity to come along, um, and uh, and you know that obviously, um, you know, you know upsets people when it's when the time frame is going on and on without without employment, and and that gets deeper and deeper, which is which is never a good thing. Um, but looking at looking at interim assignments is um, you know is is a really is a really positive method and, and can really add value and add, and add skills that you that you may not already have. I think one one point that is really really important um, and it's something that that we talk to people about all the time is 
is it's absolutely fine to apply for something that that you that you feel you're relevant for even if your your skill set doesn't match but what you really need to do is be able to articulate why you're applying for that there will be a reason as to why you think that you you're relevant for that job but maybe your cv's not and i think that where people um, sometimes go wrong is they will they will forward a cv or an application to a job without any context as to yeah. as to why they're actually applying so you know working out how to articulate that and actually sending that across with a cv or an application is really really important especially on you know interim assignments as well where you know you may you may take a side step um, or even in some in some instances what you feel is is a, is a step back which is not always a bad thing um, but you may be taking a step back because what that what that job holds is is a skill set that you can also gain from doing that job so if you just forward your cv somebody may think wow you know this person's a bit heavyweight for this role without actually understanding why you're applying for that role so in short if you're going to apply for something that you think you're too heavyweight for or you maybe haven't got the full skill set make sure you articulate to them why you're applying great thanks gareth um right and um i think we'll move on to our our, our third poll now um what is the most important factor when considering a job opportunity this is a multiple choice we'd ask you to pick three or five uh, those those categories being culture, compensation, location, job title, career progression, and employer brand. Right, how are we getting on there, Matt? Yeah, there's still a lot of um, voting going on at the moment, Matt, so I'm going to leave it for a few more seconds, if that's okay. Um, there's quite a lot happening. This is where we find everyone's ticked everything. You see you see what I meant, guys? <laughs> Flexibility and clarity, it's the, um, it's the mix. Yeah. Okay, it's still, still voting happening, so just bear with us. Okay, I think that's it. I'm going to end the poll, and I'm just now going to share the results with you. So you Great. can see on the screen those results. Great. It, you know, it's obviously clearly you can see their culture, which is very, very important. Conversation is very, very high. Location, which will be quite interesting. And I think probably not one for now, but through the course of this series, we're going to sort of probably see that the future of work and what an office is actually needed for now. And just from what me and Gareth have seen at the moment, we are, you know, there are more, you know, uh, the roles that we see coming in, location is not a factor um, because of the nature of how people perceive work going. Uh, career progression, you can clearly see there, which is important. And employer brand, a little bit lower than what we would have probably anticipated, actually. So we do get a lot of people who are very focused on brands, but uh, that's very, very good, to, to, good for us to see. So uh, thanks for everyone for voting there. So um, as we move on to... Um, Question four, um, you know, learning new skills, how and what is available out there? So this is probably very relevant to, uh, to you, Gareth, uh, to give us an overview of your uh, experience. Yeah, well, I, I take us back to um, um, to the first poll where, you know, if I got these figures right, you know, 63% of, of people on, uh, on this, on this uh, call um, are feeling worried and 26% um, and are, are feeling very cautious. So, you know, if we, if we assume that you've got, uh, you've got a split of people that are in jobs that are, you know, slightly concerned about their role, you've got people that are maybe utilising um, or, or their companies are utilising the, the furlough scheme, um, and they're obviously, you know, clearly, clearly worried uh, as whether they will be going going back or not. Um, and uh, and and then and with with regards to um, to those individuals, I think that again, what's really really important is is that if you are on furlough or and you are at home, don't look at that as a as a, as a you know overly negative thing. Look at that as a as a positive thing, and you've got all this time. Um, that you can really, really in, in, invest in invest in yourself, and and I would start by um, by saying, you know, you need to start with the end in mind here, and and something that that, that I've always advised people to do is to build a skills matrix of, um, you know, of, of where you want to get to career wise, and then build a matrix of of what skills you've got and maybe what skills you lack, 
Um, and then with regards to the skills you lack, you can then, you know, d through home-based learning or work-based learning, start to develop and, um, and gain that, that uh, suite of skills that, that, that will help you. So um, I think identifying those is, is really, really important. And, and you can look at those as in two ways. You can look at the home-based working, or you can look at the the person excuse me the personal learning so um you know we've already touched on on uh, you know interim assignments and what they can give you with regards to extra skill sets whilst you're working on assignments in different companies and and that could be cultural or it could be skills based so working in a in a larger company um, with a very very different culture that again adds to somebody's you know skill set rather than just being being task driven um, but um, uh, you know, from a from a home based working perspective, uh, you know, at Roll Half we've got two platforms that that we utilise for external candidates. Um, one is our e learning platform, um, where we have ebooks, courses, audio books. Um, there's some LinkedIn learning, and and many subjects are covered from um, you know you know everything that um, that you would need from administration, technology, finance. Um, and, it, and, you know, from a tech perspective, we've got cloud computing, Power BI, Azure, um, you know, UX, UI. Um, and and from, a, from a financial perspective, you know, there are, there are transactional learnings and, and also qualified learning courses on there. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's brilliant. We've also got um, something which is IKM, um, which is a, a skills assessment uh, tool whereby, um, you know, candidates and, and clients of, of ours can, can actually go online and take tests. Um, and they can see the results that they get, which again can, you know, that can further enhance when you send something like that with a CV or it's something that you can articulate to a prospective employer. Um, and those are those are something that, you know, we, we, we operate that as an added value, um, get in contact with us and we can put you in touch with the right people that can send you the links to um, to actually take those. And then from a um, something that I enjoy, um, enjoy doing myself. Um, is you know from a from a softer skill perspective um you know from from what we you know what we call eq which is you know for those of you that have not heard that phrase you know emotional intelligence there are some you know there are some great ted talks where you can you know you google ted talks and, and look at certain subjects and whether that is on motivation um you know managing through uh, change being part of change um you know motivating yourself in a in a, in a tough situation you know they're, they're, they're really uplifting and they can give you some great ideas and they can really change your mindset um you know uh, your mindset in in a very difficult period um the other thing is if you if you google um, uh, free training courses, you know, that there's, there's loads that come up that you can look at. Um, one is, um, one that, that sometimes I, 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 um, I guide maybe, uh, the more, the more, um, junior members of, or less experienced people is to, to give a grad a go. And there are a load of, um, there are a load of real entry level free online courses on there that you can have a read through. And, um, and another one is, um, is called myworldofwork.co.uk, which again is a learn and a learn and train, um, free online courses there. So there are absolute, um, there are absolute host of things that you uh, that are out there that you can do. Um, and, and finally, I would just say, um, you know, from a from a client perspective, um, clients like to see people um, developing themselves personally. So if you're if you're out of work or you're seeking employment, and you go to a client and say, um, you know, I haven't got that skill set, but I'm I'm willing to learn it. That's one thing. But if you go to a client and say, I haven't got that skill set, but whilst I've been off, I've taken this course. And, you know, although I haven't got any, um, you know, any practical experience of this, I've read up on it. And this is what I know so far. And from a client's perspective, just, you know, that's showing that, that it's giving them confidence that, you know, you're a self-starter, you're proactive and you do actually care about, about your career and you care about developing. And, and, and in markets like this, that goes an, an awful long way. So um, so don't overlook that by, by any means. Great, thanks Gareth. And I think we've had a few questions come up on the chat uh, function. Robert Half has an e-learning platform we can send out. If anyone um, at the end of this drops us an email, we can give you access to that if you're registered with Robert Half. It is, it's phenomenal, it has uh, over 5,000 courses, learning, learning programs available. So it's a great tool to, as Gareth said, invest in yourself in, in maybe uh, in this period where you probably have more time on your hands. So we have one, before we go to the Q and A, I think we've got one question that we will go to, which is our question five, which ties very nicely in with what Gareth talked about, soft skills, hard skills. So what is a good way to really identify your skills and areas of development in your hard and soft skill sets? 
Shall I start with, with that one? Um, yeah, that's great. So a, a really good way to do that is feedback. So we've already talked about kind of, you know, linking in with people. Um, you don't have to be in a, in a job to be able to get feedback from people around you um, or, you know, people you've worked with before. So I really would say to you, you know, have a think about the things that traditionally people have told you you're really good at. Have a think about the things that you perhaps have struggled with. And as Gareth was saying, this is a great time to fill those gaps. So I was working with someone recently who has a real challenge around um, Excel. She spent this time, you know, kind of upskilling herself on that. So that's a great way to do it. Um, the other thing that I would encourage you to do is um, think about, from a soft skill perspective, the type of reactions um, that you get quite a lot. So um, often we have similar reactions or people kind of come across in a similar way. Um, and this is a really good time to start thinking around what are the habits. So perhaps, you know, you're perhaps a little bit abrupt. Perhaps, you know, it's you haven't always enjoyed the interpersonal elements of work. This is a great time to do some kind of soul searching and reflection and think around whether you really want to do that moving forward or whether you need to move into a, a role that doesn't have it. Um, and that links back to my previous question, my previous point of getting really clear, being really flexible, but starting to be really clear around what the feedback that people have given you has told you is going to be a great way for you to move forward. Jana, I don't know what, what you think about that. I think that um, if you're looking at skill set, a lot of the a, a lot of the evidence for your skill set is going to be in what you've actually done. So, for example, if you've if you worked on a project that went really well, that might be something that ultimately you talk about at interview. Think through what was involved from your point of view in completing that project. What kinds of skills did you bring to bear, both hard and soft? So it could be particular technical competencies. It could be influencing skills. It could be a whole host of things and ultimately you're going to be able to sell your skills most effectively by drawing on the evidence of what you've actually done so i think that's a great start point great thanks janet thanks emma um so i think now um i think we've got a number of uh questions that have come in so um maybe is now a good time matt to move to q a and we can open it up to the panelists yeah absolutely um Okay, so I want to go back to, I think, um, a question that Gareth, you were answering with regards to sort of taking interim roles at the moment. So um, is it frowned upon to leave a permanent role for an interim role while you pursue a different career path? Um, yeah, well, absolutely not. In, in, you know, in, in my opinion, um, sometimes... Uh, you know, sometimes people people um, people believe that if they get some interim assignments on on their CV that they're less marketable, which is you know which is absolutely not the case. And and I think that um, you know this comes down to to something I mentioned earlier, where whereby um, you know using a recruitment agency, the biggest benefit that you get to using a, a recruitment agency is is that the consultants and um, and leaders in you know in our, in our business are, are experts at articulating somebody's experience and are experts at you know getting people. Um, you know, in front of a client when maybe their maybe their CV doesn't look overly overly relevant, um, and um, you know, whereas whereas candidates and you know it, you know people that are are, are essentially looking for jobs, um, you know, you're not experts in that, and, uh, and and that's why I said earlier it's really important to be able to articulate why you're why you're going for that job. Um, so you know, if you if you take an interim if you take an interim assignment because, for example. Um, you know, you you've got all all small company experience, um, and uh, and and you feel that you know you'd love to work for a big corporate business. Um, making the transfer from a smaller business to a to a to a larger business can sometimes be tricky on a permanent basis, but you know it, it could, could could be far easier done on an interim basis. So that would make absolute sense for somebody to um, to take an interim role in order to get their foot in the door and and, and gain that skill set because a bigger company. Um, I've worked for for a, for a smaller business um, and I've worked for a, biz, a bigger business and uh, and although the principle is the same, the culture is very very different. So you know just just having that experience and being in that big business culture will you know will really really add to that to that skill set and if you know again when you're articulating to somebody as to why you took that interim role um that makes perfect sense um but if you um you know if you if you if you're unable to articulate as to why why you why you took that or you don't you don't um proactively articulate it then that's when um sometimes people will uh, you know people can ask questions you need to give them the answer before they ask 
Could I just add something to this one as well? Um, and, and I think this is really important. I love the use of the word frowned upon. So, you know, we are in a different world of work now, guys. So actually, you know, what you will find is the reason, and I, I speak as someone who's worked in resourcing for, you know, kind of 12 years, both uh, external and internal, um, there isn't that divide anymore. And if there is, then you don't want to work in that organization because it means their talent acquisition team cannot spot talent. Um, you know, the idea of a squiggly career, I think is the phrase people are talking about at the moment, is happening much more um, kind of regularly. So please don't be worried about that. And I'd also just suggest, I couldn't tell from the way the question was phrased, but either you were taking an interim role to get into the market you want to be in, in which case, what an amazing move, or you were taking an interim role leaving a market you didn't want to be in anymore. So either way, it doesn't make any difference. And I, I would urge all of you, um, let's let's stop trying to think that you know we have to look a certain way in our careers at the moment actually there's a lot more movement than we've ever seen before and i think this is going to give indications you know people are going to leave and go to different careers and jobs in a way we haven't seen before so do not worry about the judgment that people are going to have on your cv I, for me it's getting less and less brilliant thanks emma I, you know i'd probably just like to add that you know um i talked about it last week but you know um interim work is not frowned upon like it used to people you choose it as a profession it is very highly valued and in any downturn or any um you v-shaped upturn that we hope is coming interim is going to be very very buoyant so please don't look at it in any negative way it is only a strength um okay matt ne any next question yeah, I think, Emma, I'm going to pass this one to you. Um, I think this is this question is about what advice um, do you have for people looking to make a career transition and specifically around, um, you know, job specs require previous experience, uh, but clearly someone looking for a career change doesn't necessarily have that experience. So yeah. what advice would you give? Okay, so there's two elements to this. Um, the first is, you know, you have to be realistic. So say, for example, if I decided I wanted to be a nurse, I have no nurse experience, right? So do you just think about actually what is what is realistic? However, what I'm going to assume the post is asking is where do you move from one industry to another? Um, if they are saying sector experience is absolutely essential, that's normally just to try and weed out millions of applications they're going to get. So again, include that cover letter and say, I don't have that, but this is the demonstration that I've got. Um, and the second thing I would say is actually you need to start demonstrating your interest in that area. So, you know, reach out, make contacts in that area, make um, links with people either on LinkedIn or write to people. Equally do courses, understanding that utility or do voluntary work. And I think it was Janet who said it before. You know, if you can say, I, I was working with someone recently who wants to work in the charity sector, comes from a big corporate. And what he's doing is volunteering on his weekends to actually get that charity experience. So that's how you start to build that up. Um, and the other thing I would say is I think we are going to see a shift in terms of um, the clarification from organizations on sector specificity. I think we're going to start seeing a bit of a move around people being more open, but you have to bear in mind internal resourcing consultants have to weed people out in some way. And this is normally just the, the first one to get through. So build that experience, build the links and really articulate it in your CV and your cover letter. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. Um, I think there's a lot of questions actually around the CV in particular. I've got another question here, which is how can a CV with a completely different work history stand up applying for a job in a different role, although you send a cover letter? So based on experience, cover letters most of the time are not considered. So what are your what's your advice? I don't know whether I can pass that to Janet. Oh, sure. I think some of it depends on the structure of your career and whether or not it's possible to present your experience more in a, a skills-led format rather than using reverse chronology. And I know some of the recruiters might wince when I say that because I think recruiters like to be able to see where you've worked, doing what and when. Um, I think cover letters, I think if you're asked to provide a cover letter then always do and give a lot of thought to it and what goes in that cover letter is often going to be determined by what you are asked for. So, so study the um, job advertisement very carefully. If you're not asked for a cover letter, then, then sometimes I'm afraid it will be disregarded just down to the sheer volume of applications. It's just not possible to read cover letters. So I think if, you're, if your work history looks on the face of it very different, try and think of some of the common threads. What are your transferable skills? because skills are rarely unique to a particular job 
work environment, business or sector. So if it's influencing people, if it's working in multicultural teams, what, whatever it might be, so long as you understand the competencies that are being looked for, you should be able to draw those out from what you've done before and then make it clear how they are going to relate to the new environment. So it is very much a case of studying what's being asked for and then matching what you've done and where your experience has been to what are effectively a series of questions. Can you do this? Can you help us out here? Yeah, well, I think um, uh, the, the thing I'd add, uh, you know, I think that's absolutely spot on, Janet. And, um, you know, the, the, the only thing that I would, um, you know, I, I would add to that is the, the amount of, um, of people and, and, and friends that have asked me um, for, for advice. And, um, and when I talk to them, they have, they have one CV um, that they send out to every single, every single job. Um, and, uh, and, and then when, when I sit with them and, and talk through their skill set and talk through what they've done previously, we start pulling out all this, all this, all this great stuff that is not on their one generic CV. And we kind of, you know, rewrite the CV and tailor that CV um, towards the job. And, and back to what I, I said earlier is there will be a reason as to why you're applying for that job. You will definitely have some transferable skills. Um, you will definitely have, 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 have gained some skills in, in the past that will be relevant to that, to that, um, to the job that you're applying for. So, you know, you need, you need to um, tailor a CV that is relevant for that job in order for it to, um, you know, for, uh, in order for it to, uh, to, to gain their attention. And, you know, I'm not suggesting for, for one minute that anybody puts something on a CV that, that is, um, you know, that is untrue. Um, but you know you've got to bring to the forefront the skills that that you feel you've got in order to apply for that role. Great, thanks, Gareth and Janet. So maybe Matt, have we got time for one more? Maybe I think we've got time for a couple more actually. Yeah, um, I've got here. Will a gap in my CV harm my chances when looking for future positions? Okay, uh, I Janet. <laughs> No, not automatically by any means. And I mean, years ago, a gap in your CV, you know, was something to be concerned about. Um, these days, absolutely not. I think the most important thing is to be transparent about the fact that there is a gap. Um, if you did do anything at all during that gap, whether it was voluntary work, um, even if you went traveling, then make it clear that, you know, you did a something so that people can't conclude that you just sat at home and, and, and didn't make any attempts to do anything. Um, and, you know, sometimes there are circumstances that arise utterly beyond people's control, which is why there's a gap. But increasingly, it's also perfectly acceptable to choose to have a career break. And nobody ever needs to feel defensive about that. So, I th again, I think, you know, integrity and transparency are absolutely key here. And it isn't something to be concerned about automatically or to be ashamed of. Many years ago when I, when I was recruiting uh, factory workers, we always worried if there was a gap because we thought it meant somebody had been in prison. So uh, unless, unless that's why you have a gap, then uh, you're probably okay. Yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, quite simply, um, you know, you, you haven't, you know, you shouldn't have a gap on your CV. If, if there is a, a gap in timeline, put on there what you've been doing. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, there, there should never be a, a gap in a gap in a CV as, um, as you know, as Janet rightly stated, if you've, if you've had a break for something, um, then actually put that onto your CV. Okay. Great. Thanks. Gareth. Question um, Matt. Yeah, okay. I think this one was aimed at Emma. I'd also like to bring Cheryl into this one as well, if that's okay. Um, Emma, I think you mentioned um, earlier on about working with the right people. Mm -hmm. um, and the question here is, um, you know, I've been searching for the right people or person for the last five years, and it's by far the biggest challenge. And I haven't met that right person or consultant. Um, I suppose uh, between you and Cheryl, have you got any advice? Cheryl, do you want to go first? <laughs> I will do. And not just because Emma used to be a consultant, obviously. <laughs> really good one, guys. Really good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know whether I count myself as as kind of lucky, but um, in the past, certainly for me, I've I've had a couple of consultants, well, more than more than just a couple actually, where I've just developed a really really good working relationship. So, you know, it's a two way thing working with a consultant. Um, you know, I always kind of say, don't just wait until you need a job. You know, kind of keep in touch update them with kind of what you're doing, what you're thinking, et cetera, and have those, you know, have those coffee catch-ups where, you know, I've sat down with consultants and talked long-term about my 
kind of career goals and objectives and then I've, I've effectively had consultants almost like work with me towards those so when I was moving from perm to interim as like a career choice that was something that was planned almost like discussed years before with a consultant I then sat down with a consultant years later who helped me rework the CV um, and then in terms of placing roles so um, I know sometimes kind of we think you know there's good and bad and it's difficult to find somebody but I think sometimes the onus has to be on us particularly the more senior you get to try and shape that relationship and find the right person be completely open with you know who you are what you're looking for so that your consultant can actually really kind of get into your personality into your psyche and help to place you in the right roles yeah uh, i suppose i would add to that um and things probably have changed i'm sure since i was a consultant um but the candidates who i really used to love placing were absolutely you know the ones with fantastic cvs but also the ones that were really pleasant and wanted it to be a, a kind of a two-way process um, the other thing i would say is when i was referring to finding the right people i didn't just mean recruitment consultants you know there's a whole network of people out there to help you um and if you're struggling to find those people um one thing i always ask is what do you do to put back into your industry so there are lots of places that you can help and mentor people who, have done, who are trying to do the kind of work that you are doing. Um, and certainly I found more recently, it's no offense to our recruitment colleagues, but you know that informal networking actually can be really helpful as well as a way to give you the heads up when something's coming or to give you the kind of indication that something's shifting in the marketplace. So you know, if you don't feel you're getting that, the answer for me is always pay it forward. So who can you help with? Who can you advise? Because I guarantee you when that starts to happen, um, you know you feel better because you're actually giving something back into the industry or the sector in which you work but also um you become known as somebody who is you know pleasant pleasant to work with and, and kind of keen to help so it isn't always around what you need to get from the relationship it can be the other way around and please please for all of you don't be the type of person um and i say this as a ex-head of resourcing who is all over agencies until you get a job and then refuses to answer their calls afterwards there's something here around just being polite and appropriate and building really great commercial relationships as well as personal ones. Um, everyone deserves to be spoken to pleasantly and that's why um, I'm a mug but I always answer cold calls because actually it's just someone trying to do their job and I think that stands you in a really good stead. Mm. I can see the consultants nodding there, so Matt and Gareth, you know. Feel free, call cool, whatever you want, that's so good. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, Cheryl and Emma, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think from my perspective, um, I've always seen candidates and clients because it's exactly the same thing. I've, I've enjoyed working with clients who've become candidates and candidates who've become clients. And I think, you know, um, to Cheryl's point, I sit with clients I've known for many years now and talk about what, what they want, what the ideal role is, where they're going. And I think when you build up a great relationship and rapport with a recruiter, um, hopefully that is Robert Half, um, they start to talk to you about things and, and maybe they even call you with roles that, that when you're really passively looking, and we had a situation recently where someone said, if you get this job, um, FP&A within a, you know, a public sector environment where I can make a difference, please give me a call. We gave him a call and said, guess what? And it happened. Yeah. I think that only comes from the two-way conversations um that you've got to have those little conversations all the time it can't you can't only engage when you're looking and disengage when you find something i think um you know we're very passionate about building the relationship and at robert half we talk a lot about it's never about closing a, a, a placement it's about opening a relationship and i think for us that's what makes it interesting and and we get to know everyone and we we have a good network and, and we work around it i don't know if you'd add anything gareth no, I, I, I would just, uh, I would just echo what you say, Matt. It's, um, you know, it's like a light switch, and you know, you can't turn the light switch switch on and off. It's just like a dimmer switch, and and it just, uh, you know, it, you know, it's dim for a little bit, and you know, you you keep in contact. But yeah, absolutely, there's nothing more frustrating from from either side, from a, you know, from a candidate or a client where a consultant um, doesn't call them back, or um, you know, or or, or, or actually, um, you know, moves away from that relationship and goes quiet. There's nothing worse than that for a candidate or a client. And on the on the flip side of that, again, you know, from a you know from myself who, who's you know be, been you know all the way through the ranks as a consultant. There's um, there's nothing more frustrating than when you work with somebody really closely um, to get them a great opportunity, and then and then the minute that that's placed, um, you know, there, you, you sometimes think, what have I done? Um, have I done something wrong? Because it's uh, yeah, the lights go off. So no, I would just echo what you say. It is absolutely a, a relationship. And, and, you know, the same with me, the, some of the individuals that, that I deal with now, um, I, I placed as an, as an accounts assistant um, 12, 13 years ago, and they're now, you know, running shared service functions. So, um, you know, and, and we still joke about 
or you know when I place them with no experience into an interim role so um, so yeah I think the relationship is really important yeah fantastic great thanks uh, Matt maybe one more or we still got time I, one more okay so um, I think this refers back to one of the questions we asked earlier about learning um, so how do hiring organizations look at free online courses when compared to something accredited which obviously comes at a cost so how do people view that um, look I think I think you know I, I spoke about this um, previously so I'll, I'll make a brief comment and then pass over to um, you know to, to somebody else but um, I, I can't see how any how, how anybody can look at um, look at somebody you know developing themselves personally or, or deciding to um, you know you know further learn themselves as a negative. Um, it's just got to be a positive in in any, in any way shape shape or form, and it, and it depends as to um, as to you know as to whether the role um, that that they require um, needs a you know uh, an accredited course in order for them to complete that task but um in short for me um i don't think you can ever deem any anybody that's self-developing or, or learning themselves um as a negative no and i think you're also assuming please don't worry too much about this because i have been a i have been a head of resourcing and i have been a recruitment consultant and trust me I was just excited when someone had done a course. I didn't go off and Google it to work out how much it had cost and whether it was a free resource because yeah. I just didn't have time. So, you know, please don't overthink that. It's not necessarily the um, awarding body unless, as Gareth says, it's an accreditation, in which case you'd recognise it anyway. Um, you know, it's just the, the willingness being shown. Um, so, so please, I, I, I wouldn't worry about that at all from my perspective. Great. Okay. So, um, I think maybe um, I make it sort of uh, 52 minutes past 12. So uh, I think we'll, we'll bring this to a close. So, you know, thanks for everyone's questions. As I reiterated at the start of this, if there's anything that anyone wants to reach out to, um, we'll show the details of people on the panel. Please feel free to reach out to us and, and we can personalize it and, and really sort of um, to your current situation. Um, so before I sort of conclude, um, I just want to say a massive thank you to uh, the panelists. Uh, we have three external individuals who are very, very busy, who have given up their time uh, to invest uh, in this webinar and this series. Uh, this is the second week in a row that we've had them. So we're absolutely delighted. So a massive thank you to Cheryl, Janet and Emma. Um, Gareth, thanks for your insights as well. Um, you know, I think uh, you'll see Gareth's email, so please reach out and to him. I have an apology to make. I forgot to introduce Matt Robinson, who is our one of our directors of leadership development who's pulled this series together. So a massive apology to you uh, there, Matt. Um, you can see all the details there. Um, and um, as I said, please reach out. Um, I think just in conclusion, uh, you, know, you know, thanks for everyone's um, input on the polls. It gives us a gauge on how to steer these, th this event. Um, I think, you know, hopefully everyone's uh, taking something away from this, uh, this section, which is on realizing the opportunity. I probably come back to poll one. There seemed to be a lot of worry, um, frustration about the situation. Um, I think on behalf of myself and Gareth, you know, we are, we will see or, or perceive ourselves as a barometer of the marketplace. We speak to, um, we have 22 offices across the UK. Uh, we've been in the industry for 72 years across varying different industries. And, you know, hopefully everything that was discussed was applicable if you're an accountant to a developer, to a creative designer. Um, we see a lot of, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, hope and uh, vision for what the market's gonna bring. I think, you know, clearly there's a few challenging moments over the coming months, but I think that the redesign, the reimagination post the return phase is very, very strong. Um, we are being engaged and talked about a number of projects. We're seeing sequential movement in the job flow uh, and every week it's getting back to normal or pre-COVID rates. Um, so we feel very, very confident and we were on a seminar the other uh, last week with a chief economist who's, who's predicting this is gonna be V-shaped. Um, so it's, um, you, know, you know, hopefully everyone should, should feel confident that things are gonna happen. I think some of the things that I take away from this, um, from all the questions is think about what's possible, see this as an opportunity to reimagine your own career, have an open mind, um, they say future, uh, fortune favours the brave. Um, I think Cheryl mentioned a comment about just changing your brain, running something differently, sort of reprogram it, see this as an opportunity to, to have a blank canvas. 
um, and really sort of, you know, map out, have a vision of what you want to do, where you want to be. You know, often they say, find your passion, find your purpose. Maybe if you start with the end in mind and work backwards of where you want to get to, um, everyone has support networks, colleagues, reach out to them who, who can maybe give you in, some insights of what you're good at, where you've added value, what you can contribute to any organization or any employer. Um, I think Emma really sort of honed in on the resentment piece. Everyone is having challenging times. It is a tough time for everyone. Um, but I think it's really important that, that you kind of, um, you get rid of that. Um, when you go to an interview, you've got to be very positive. You can't be negative about your employer, the situation, what's happened. Um, I had a very good client of mine who always used to say, Matt, send me thermostats, not thermometers, meaning I want thermostats, people who radiate energy rather than therm uh, thermometers who, who, who um, reflect it. So I think it's about showing you've got energy and um, you're, you're really going to make a contribution to an environment or an employer structure and, and planning is very, very important as well. So um, I think there was a, a really good point on networks expanding your networks, getting to know lots of different people, and also probably finally investing in yourself. There's um, paid courses, there's free courses, there's the e-learning platform from Robert Half as well, and we can send you more details about that. But I, I think, um, you know, invest in yourself, see this as an opportunity to think differently. Um, the whole world's gonna be different, uh, the whole future of work's gonna be different, and I think it's a really good opportunity for everyone to, uh, to, to, to really take that on board. So, so with that, um, I just want to put a, um, a shout out for next week. Uh, the next week's forum is personal branding and networking. Um, so that'll be another great event. Um, so we'd be delighted if you can join us. Um, and with that, we'll, um, we'll bring it to a close and let everyone go out and enjoy the, the, the fantastic weather. So thanks for taking the time and look forward to uh, speaking with you um, either directly or seeing you on next week's forum. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.